Alinea. To do something right, it must be done twice. The first time instructs the second. Joseph Auguste Antenor Fermin. Since the dawn of time, sellers consider romanticism, distress, context, and rage as strong factors in devising their traps. Hominids are always like an excited dog wagging its tail and waiting to chase after the next ball. Is there any humanoid left who does not care to have just now? Whether it is wanting something more, something new, something different, or perhaps even someone different, the glut of enticing goods, services, and machinery has given human beings pretexts and ways of being venal. Other than the number of alternatives for satisfying severe craving, there is hardly anything new under the 21st century sun. Gimmicks are used to continuously to make old farts taste, feel, sound, and smell new. Even when there is something new, people lovesick with the old made new can't tell that the new is actually new. Every popular apologue has its stark reality. Ancient civilizations have left behind traces of hazing traditions and rituals which validate the universality of uncertainty's avoidance. The old cultural hubris and the industrialist pious facades painted capitalism as the pinnacle of civilization and social perfection. English moneyers had zilch class. They were obsessed by creating transcendent explanations and answers to their community's inequalities. Their versions of the commerce and trade Septuagint progressively decimated a certain emergent common sense around their time. They brutally shoved and locked poverty and injustice into a dark underground vault. Next, they began to erect gorgeous edifices for middle-class self-enslavement. Even to say the word self-enslavement was to invite polemic. On the humanization of the labor phase, something must have gone awry in the 80s for first Baron Keynes, CBA, FBA, to be thrown in the same league of false prophets as Karl Marx. Long-term recommendations for contemporaneous torments hardly incorporate paragime shift constancy. The deployment of scientific breakthroughs rebooted men, women, and children's attention. Automation increased the ability to make more of things. Labor recompenses and working hours have not been juristically amended, but human beings are snatching others and are trading them like any other commodity faster than ever before. Moneyers look at automation, which projects us in the future while holding everything else in the past. Great minds of the past, who formulated solutions for socioeconomic wrongs, now required more than one or two generations for a linear trend. We fell into Thomas Malthus's trap. Technologies taking off will continue to have awful consequences for labor for as long as it disassociates with means that it generates. For the most part, the level of interdependence a society maintains among its members and the extent to which people are forced to control their desires and impulses are deemed factors irrelevant to socioeconomic injustice. At the same time, the assertion has prevailed that one particular religion is the only group to have silly codes of belief in old rituals. There is also a sense that coteries and theism constantly and instantly redefine only poor country sociocultural layers and loyalties. It justifies why common mortals tend to act in a more individualistic way over disputes. We do not join the collective enthusiasm unless it is to get away social welfare. A predator has preferences. Wolves are major predators of rodents. Prey comes from the indifference perspective. Insect pests are preyed on by all kinds of small birds. As far as humans go, the prey and predator roles are fluid, but we all fall prey to the fallacy of provincialism, implicitly making judgments based on the familiarity of what we are used to in our cluster. Patching up ethical holes, as we have been doing, can no longer last like it's used to. The incompatibility is due to the considerable gap between today's behaviors and the flourishing deviations and rules of recompense installed more than two centuries ago. A paragime shift does not spontaneously trigger the mindset's shift in the right direction. The world has yet to stop eavesdropping on capitalistic pleasers, lumpen intellectuals. We should instead be paying attention to the 21st century's cultural patterns and crown the latest paragime shift as the appropriate way of settling commerce and trade wrangles.
Materialists and relativists should not be the only ones to concede the changes in our existences. The idiocy of slum, ghetto, shackdown, rat hole, and racial subcategories frictions is the mere fact that the poor communities hold relatively the same disgusting, musky smell of despair. The wealthy cheerers hold an idea of affirmation that fortune is amassed only by agonizing the poor. The poor believe that their losses are directly caused by a new frail hand gaining access to the crumbs. As I said before, and I'm going to scream out loud again, in reality, it does not need to be so. Some perceptions are based on the collective views developed and maintained with a particular society as opposed to it existing naturally. People take them for implicit agreements among the members of a society to cooperate with social benefits. A social construct of a specific group imposed on the rest of the society, or perceived as inherent, does nothing more than contribute to social volality. The premise of prosperity has misplaced critical pieces in the grand pattern of human endeavor. The labor class has nothing to break the chains with, but prudence to relieve, and folly to cure. I shall admit that a global program to sterilize the children of anyone who reaches a particular wealth cap is not such a bad idea. A chance would be given to others to ride on the 1% or wagon. More than that, it is time for an original social, commerce and trade, and political system. This ought to reflect the individualization of open interactions occurring now in our daily lives. Its skeleton should not be a pile of morality, ethics, and trustworthiness arguments. All humans, to some degree, or when it is favorable to them, subscribe to historic views on the evolution of human thought. To determine whether a new concept fits the 21st century, the measure of which is conflict resolution blocks using reason and reality, ought to be examined. Competition is the law of the jungle, but cooperation is the law of civilization. Pyotr Alexeyevich Kooptin Lumpen intellectuals and moneyers have the infinite capacity to truncate the disenfranchised delusions and ludicrous misinterpretations of evidence regarding past civilizations into one dimension, which is then presented as vital to liberty and prosperity. Their fantasies do not spring out of tenuous social comfort, but rather conspiracies. A sage who comes with the sensitivity to actual human experiences, or some sense of emotion, gets placated even when the parallels between their rational and their real world are incredible. Instead, a character of unconscionable conducts at the bottom of the social pyramid are ultimately drawn out of their self-deprecating mosaic, and psychotic episodes induced by moneyers are placed on the forefront. The marginalized path from dogma's naivety to disenchantment almost inevitably ensures rancor and embitterment towards those adjuciated, lower-ranking humans. When we get in front of a mirror, we scale back the expression that is indeed natural to us. We practice what we think we ought to give. Universal indolence serves as a trampoline for the free marketers' assertions of their triumphs over the financial crisis they caused. Neoclassical presumptions once again effortlessly resurrect the naive sense of new financial boom's longevity. The One World Anthem is exhilarating for cavaliers. The non-interventionalism slogan, another one of the fruits of Western moneyers and lumpen intellectuals' collusion, is still able to tease out some of the appealing free market ideas about one's freedom. In reality, the unnecessary bond between residents of sophisticated and backwards nations is widening commerce and trade's maturity gap between the two factions. The domestic battalions of unemployed readiness are tainted by the know-how disparity between wealth and developing nations. Pathetic republics are seen Pathetic republics are seen as their arrears wipe out as a consolation prize. Tyrants are undergoing reddictomy procedures to fit in new realities. Labor savviness is rearranging the moneyers and working poor's umbilical cords. The substance of the 21st century commerce and trade reflections lack appropriate computing conventions to trigger the correct defiance to norms and conventions. The post-mortem claim is sealed in the Western academia commerce and trade bubble. It has been abused in order to point out the social context of the crappy part of the hemisphere. Let's be sincere. E-commerce runs on our commerce. 
The profit motive is not colorblind. It does not care about religion and politics. The knowledge-based economy is getting framed as the story of competitiveness rather than a frantic contribution to social progress. The lure of recognition is overrulingly rational. Humans are nothing more than symbols. It may readily be imagined that, after a long series of disillusionment, people begin to think in a modern way, which will improve their level of subsistence and comfort. The transactional relationship between master and the self-enslaved has, in turn, beautified the psychological degrading of everyone from the middle to the bottom of the human scale. The mockery of their labor is bloating the class of the working poor. We potentially have enough wealth to pass around, but the world is fixated on substitutes for the right and wrong reasons, and is oblivious to the hidden costs of capitalism and the glaring naivety of communism. The scarcity hypothesis squeezes off wealth distributions, horrible mixtures, while obscuring creativity. The endorsement of investment hocus-pocus and exciting financial voodoo prolifications are modern-day ruses to defer to Martians the responsibility of instilling reason in humankind. Ideology's recruitment and popular support relies more on psychologic coercion or weapons than on coherence of opinions. Those who merely see humankind's new dreadful saga as something to approve or condemn have yet to go through the rigmarole of its revolution. As a species, we reign supreme over the earth, even with distinctive displays of a marked lack of wisdom. The age of electricity and phosphorescent beams feels removed from the story of our forefathers. Tolerance for social and political injustice and its natural shape and usage is deeply anchored in an obsession with singularity and the exceptionality pervading human history. The laissez-faire nature underwrites bestial phantasms. Never have I dealt with anything more difficult than my own soul, which sometimes helps me and sometimes opposes me. Abu Hamid al-Ghazi During the Cold War, there was an intense interest in the extensive experiments of brave youngsters on liberty under the auspices and with the approval of the leading countries, which added viewpoints from ideologically contaminated sources to foster bright ideas. The anti-communists, as well as their rivals, collectively recognized the duty imposed to upon them to permit all humans to benefit from the inherent right to a concise, to some extent. Bloch's leaders unleashed Beowulf's dragons on the supporters of the others. Moneyers and despots attempted to mechanize labor as much as possible to keep the poor man's disease from killing the rich man's child. What is perhaps most striking is that neoliberalists had to empty out their bag of tricks and hoary preconceptions in order to correct the asymmetric approach rationalizing the human experience. They did not do so. They become protagonists of Caesarism and the ineptitude that gnawed at national identities. Typical researchers read history from their offices and extrapolate a certain truth. Others seek real human experiences by traveling and share their discoveries with others. The latter makes a big difference in your value regarding your pocketbook and on your ability to stir up controversy by adding different perspectives into the mix. On such a journey, you make friends who you'll come to relate to more than family members or childhood friends. Because you are bonded by values rather than emotion, you run into personages and communities who are caught in the delusion of their pain and joyous uniqueness. You will be stunned by people swimming with their hands out as if they were drowning, while others who cannot swim are ready to dive into a bottomless sea. Because of the same root of compassion is also the foundation for hate, Everybody might need to love less, delegate less, French kiss less, and croon less in order to pay more attention to do more good. Pessimism curls when compassion no longer exists in the universal concept of being human. It has taken me a long time to once again lay down long prose about injustice and what to do about it. The conviction that this exercise would either be an irrelevant act or perceived as a selfish lament, has paralyzed me. Movements advocating better wages and shorter working hours in the working poor fighting vanguard have created its struggle for emancipation. We constantly fall in love with flamboyant personalities of scholars 
whose ideas are struck in the past, have only a slight nuance of the present, and project future probabilities with certainty. These reflect aspects of capitalism's identity rather than extraneous features of the exploitative device itself. We all need to come to terms with the idea that a disorder's permanence is due in part to the passive activism of the few washed away by the active passivism of the many. Moneyers are not capable of a compassionate act. In the face of the general public's dilettantism, in political economy and the paranopoly of luxury, labor-saving gadgets, self-enslavement feels less demeaning and agonizing. Moneyers have persuaded a considerable portion of the masses, especially in developing nations, that a mixture of liberalized foreign trade and investment related to state control and investments in manufacturing machinery is a driving force behind the economic boom. Squeezing the social embarrassments of the working poor like a lemon to extract the real question is seen as a vain task. Dictators and tycoons' follies de grandeur, which is not differentiable from moneyer's reckless greed, was undoubtedly essential for the sophistication of the working class, means of participation, engagement, or involvement in an enterprise. A class of the working poor is a historical necessity to organically turn the burgeoning new attitudes and desires into capitalism's gravediggers. Truth is born into this world only with pangs and tribulations, and every fresh truth is received unwillingly. Alfred Russell Wallace We have long decrypted why people strive for deliverance in really dark places using fireworks. Socialism, communism, fascism, and anarchism's not well thought out narratives of an insurgency resonated with 20th century adolescence. The total collapse of hope in Marxism's dialectual view of social transformation has reinvigorated religious zealoty, which is in the 21st century's pushing over the cliff those snot nosed kids searching for self actualization in an alternative platform. Instead of trying to fit into the box of the known, we should have been crafting a more comprehensive and dynamic social, commerce and trade, and political worldview, befitting the 21st century's reality. Alas, ego blurs creativity. The universality of the pursuit to become Superman outdoes all other folly. The appetite for being context-free exasperates information's obesity plague. Trapped between the past and future, we are on the outmost edge of figuring out the point of being human. Cognitive manipulation and perceptions reshaping have diluted the collective scientific expectation and made reality progressively irrelevant. Bands of zealous scholars have purged out the complexity of human behavior and uncertainty surrounding questions of financial injustice, preference, and indifference, and the social safety net, just to name a few. Dogmatism narrows the approach of investigations and generates a sinkhole in teaching which empowers of sophisticated dishonesty of knowledge's claims. The nauseating features of our world are its obsessive faith in statistical significance to gauge the balance of goodwill's costs and benefits, and the consensus that central questions to human existence can only be answered numerically. In a way, there is merely a space for Wakarani or Gambotsu. Theories do not focus the mechanisms on certain aspects of the world. Similarly, surveillance of an individual's spirit while trying to satisfy the necessities of the body or conveniences of the mind offer different conclusions. The most fundamental of neoclassical economists' primal musts is the ability to daze and to sway the public with incoherent hypotheses. Attempts to clarify and determine the properties and consequences of money or supremacy over other commerce and trade actors by focusing on concepts such as poverty and wealth distribution have only clouded the social injustice issue. Why do folks in this day and age perversely believe that socioeconomic injustices are a natural phenomenon of life? Although moneyer's accumulation and infrastructure are essential, productivity's increase is the key to spurring direct foreign investment and linking it with international markets. The danger of the neoclassical mindset lies in the describing productivity as efficiency and then profit. Enterprise creativity spearheads productivity to the rate we come to get accustomed to. 
to forestall strife between traditional merchants' ambitions and customers' objectives, which has led to capitalism in the first place. Innocence lent credence to unnatural social constructs. Uncompromising fanatics dispossess the disenters of their home, forced some to go into exile, and killed others on the pretext that they were cursed. For dogmatic adherence, exchanging blows in vitriol is better than pedagogic ostracism. Neoclassical economists is the stem of the obtuse lumpen intellectuals who persist in safeguarding the vortex of fallacies to keep the masses in a mockery sphere of confusion. A national body of law reflects the bias and distrust of its citizens during a specific period. Doing the right thing, from a utopian perspective, has yet to be done the right way, and for the right reasons. While some express popular anger at the free market, collectivist models were often used preemptively. Non-believers in the notion that hard science equates to mathematics do not get recognition and are denied the right to render themselves useful to social actors. But it is not the fear of jeopardizing many things in the global culture which is keeping us from doing the right things. The lack of proper reason and a way for changes, humanity stays with what it is conventional for fallacies, even if they be hundreds of years old and have a stronger inner bond with us than the facts that walk by our side. At some point in the 20th century, we abandoned the traditional of experimenting with new reality. I intended to renew it while keeping in mind that a moral ground is not enough to distill social, commerce and trade, and political injustices, or to bring down capitalism's long-standing racketeering schemes. Commerce and trade have always been about taking advantage of essentials or caprices. Today, enterprises go above and beyond to make a want into a need by devising and adding functionality to products or services. The goal remains the same, monetary gain. Today, a business which merely functions as exploitation is becoming an outdated way of making money. Newfangled rationalizations of moneyer's influences and shopper impulses are steadily brewing. Enterprises interlock more than visions and passions for making the quick buck. Conceptions of disruptive ideas are riding the wave of artistic and scientific revelation created by technological shocks to form perfect arcades. Higher-ups in an organization who use cat nine tails or play mind games to swell the monetary surplus are no longer considered to be socially, culturally, or morally cutting-edge. Everyone in an enterprise is an entrepreneur in their way. Production managers are orchestra conductors of individual means of engagement. In the service industry, enterprises' leaders' functions curate converging individuals as a mean of participating. Current commerce and trade stitch-ups of sellers and buyers, interplays are starting to be infused with social inclusiveness. It could potentially halt, right in time, the deprecation of the terms collaboration. In doing so, it will generate an appropriate social and political ecosystem for the 21st century. In my opinion, we should search for a completely different flying machine based on other flying principles. Henry Marie Coanda. From birth, two big cats were carted from town to town. Just like their ancestors in the circus industry, they were beaten until the agony disrupted their primitive instincts. They were forced to eat, drink, sleep, defecate, and urinate in a teeny cage. The only relief from their imprisonment and their handler's cruelties was during their performance in front of a roaring crowd. They fell in love during this horrific circumstance. Soon after, they became the proud parents of twin cubs, a girl and a boy. Every night, the couple wondered how they could change their children's fate. The devoted parents saved every piece of meat they could. Before they barely had a chance to get to know their kids, they sent them away to circus boarding school. The cubs were expected not only to go to circus college, but to be admitted to a prestigious one on a massive scholarship. So, they did. When you are a first-generation college student, your hopes and dreams can scald your eyes. There was pressure. They had been raised in the belief that higher education would ultimately lead to more than the ability to roam around freely and have clean food and water. They put four years into acquiring and owning the means of participating, engaging, 
or being involved in a circus show. After graduating with honors, they found the reality of post-university life to be bleak. The only option offered to them were jobs with less public humiliation and whippings compared to their illiterate parents. But the pay remained roughly the same. The circus went from jumping through some hoops of fire to more fascinating, sophisticated routines. The industry's recompense, practices, and injustices were still a disgrace to every species. We need alternatives to prevent more disappointed graduate lines and those who cannot afford higher learning. Just as circus masters and handlers, they too deserve a lion's share. This is mostly a collage of individual means for financial gains, as were pirate crews. During the golden age of piracy, everyone on the pirate ship, murderers, thugs, and thieves had their roles and duties appointed according to their knacks and knowledge. They had clever codes for splitting the gained assets and treasure between the crew in a fair manner. A pirate's income was tied to the loot the gang plundered. Bandits on the Bartholomew Roberts pirate ship were all aware that the captain and the quartermaster shall each receive two shares of a prize, the master gunner and boatswain one and one half shares, and all other officers one and one quarter, and a private gentleman of fortune one share each. Movements, mindsets, and attitudes that oppose capitalism should emphasize the procedures of rationalization instead of the actual consequences for its use for allocating enterprise monetary surplus. Our perchant for procrastinating over a new attempt to break psychological contract has three layers. There are many ways of explaining or sculpting a socio-economic story. The typical style is the neoliberal paradigm framework which depicts how money's foresight and labor muscles are combined to generate profit. This rational simplicity has an air of well-developed methodology. The fresh batches of truth-seekers face thorny theoretical issues, mostly deriving from new social factors which tend to distort the difference between needs and wants. At the same time, the lumpen intellectuals are aiding and abating money's in fine-tuning the free-for-all fallacy to the end of all powers of the poor. Attempts to impose a substitute to old social, commerce and trade, and political bonds are always going to fall flat. Our collective dreams have been monetized. We are more or less concerned about the cruel scheme of turning forced labor into a cash cow until we get shackled. Whoever indulges in collecting consciousness data as a principal method for demystifying human experiences or highlighting socioeconomic inequality nuances, runs the risk of a tense psychological block. The risk is worth the pain. Proletarians' propaganda must touch upon on splitting the lot of philosophical underpinnings, which are of great importance to the rationalization of social, commerce and trade, and political injustices. After all, an enterprise is not like a business with crematory laborer aspirations. The ruses used to trap enthusiasm is continually changing throughout time. Henceforth, we ought to continually review it as the chopping of our monetary surplus. The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith's Magnus Opus, is credited with moving the analytic bar higher than the merchantalism saloons. Let's entertain that lie. The book was an autopsy of the nature and the causes of the wealth of individuals and nations during his time. The constant interplay of living creatures, minds, and contextual factors have made know-how an alternative form of currency as we maneuver. It does not weigh more or less than money in the metric used to evaluate one another. An intentional object is given by a word or a phrase, which gives a description under which. Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe, FBA the wealth creation and distribution are the two old puzzles that keep restyling humanity morality. Wealth creation has become less of a nuance. We demystified it during the various waves of the industrial and managerial revolution. Technological innovations activated by unquenchable greed have made blue-collar workers excessively productive and generate absurd fortunes. The expected paradox is that the socioeconomic gap between the rich and the poor has widened enormously. Before coming to grips with ethosism, we need to admit that, for enterprises, the monetary and social surpluses have to be worth the risk that sales and marketing headaches pose. Every agent is engaged, 
participating or involved in the manipulation of shoppers. The existence of sacrosanct natural duality between laborers, landowners, and moneyers, or a nominal weight recomposed of any party, does not make any sense. They all ought to get a share of the manipulation gain or loss in a percentage base. There is also something else. There is a noticeable similarity between how a society, a nation, or an empire comes to be to a diamond's formation process. A diamond requires many pressures, high temperatures, and other conditions in the Earth's mantle in order to crystallize. Then, Earth poops it out through volcanic eruptions. Rough diamonds look nothing more than a bizarre rock. The hypnotizing beauty of a diamond only emerges after a complicated process of hitting the rock on the right spots and angles. What is money? Money slew the double coincidence of once travesty. The density and the velocity of the 21st century's transactions have depleted money of the medium of exchange validity. Money in every arrangements and expressions has long ceased to be the bridge between commodities. It is nowadays the nominal valuation of the energy contribution to the humanity's needs or to the engineering of humans' wants. The appraisal is highly contingent of social biases and edifying fallacies. These days, more than ever before, we have enterprises instead of commercial activities. A goal of an enterprise in a primitive to the most sophisticated form is to break shoppers' indifference by using passive to aggressive tactics more than providing a service and or a product. The control of the monetary surplus by moneyers and the philosophical inadequacy of dominant distribution of justice, dogmas, is a great concern of mine. And, I assume, to you as well. Ethosism is based on the notion that through 21st century training and education, one acquires the physical and mental abilities of participation, engagement, or involvement in an enterprise, which are all as good as money. Therefore, the recompense should reflect the paragime shift of the wealth creation paragime in the 21st century. Here, I'm going to repeat it. Capital is that means which is devoted to obtaining more means through interaction with others. Labor is not the sole source of all surplus. Money is not either. Henceforth, monetary surplus distribution ought to be from each according to his or her means, not to each according to his or her needs. Ethosism obliges the evaluation of the means of engagement, participation or implication, used or integrated in an enterprise to generate a social or monetary surplus. In a social surplus, there is always a monetary piece. The valuation attaches a price to a service or product, and when there is more than one actor involved in the mission to break the indifference of the shoppers, to award a percentage of the loot to each. Every form of recompense should be negotiated, and there should be established a term of fixed percentage of monetary surplus. However, demarcating lines should be drawn between industries in term of revenue, profit, and salary seeking. An enterprise should be prohibited from engaging in activities in more than one commerce and trade ecosystem. Compasses are only useful once you pick a stationary destination. Ethicism is a proper reason and mechanism for amending humanity's definition of making the world a better place. This operating system makes climbing in the billionaire's stratosphere harder, and at the same time, it makes social commerce and trade and political algorithms symbiosis sustainable. The hardest task for a restaurant is to convince people to come in and sit. Then, I will speak to the ashes, Sojourner Truth. Most of our multidimensional processor, our brain, needs more than learning in order to be a threat to the illusion of awareness and the presumption of knowledge. Utopians collapse under the pressure of the endless editing, toning down, and partial reshaping needed to fabricate an amiable aura around their posters to gain attention. Seasoned dissenters are immunized against philosopher's block by impotently dilating and humanizing the distinctiveness of their tones. While readjusting the unconsciousness part of the brain, one can easily be oblivious to a living in an extraordinary period. The helocentric view of commerce and trade and how labor orbits the moneyer is being rejected. The reductionist's change of heart on the state of our collective consciousness is not the admission of flaws in the human mind. Human beings are more than neurons reacting to nutrients. 
the impact of the internet is overblown. The ecosystem is finely tuned to sustain our existence or suffocate us all. Moneyers have long understood our collective consciousness, such as autonomy and complexity. It takes paying attention to pick up the wave signaling a pair regime shift. Mad scientists are working on getting closer to the beam of light, the carbon-silicon merger, part mechanical and part biological being. Would it be a stagnation or boring to live without contemplating new thoughts or prospects, deterring us from being immortal? Alternatively, is the idea of perpetual sex or the immortal poor so great as to make immortality worth it? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics have appeared to be vital cogs in the wheel of national as well as global prosperity. A popular principle is that fair procedures are the best guarantee for fair outcomes. Désolé, it is a myth. The Cuban irony demonstrates that despite a massive expenditure on education and infrastructure, the production of goods and services per unit of investment has remained steady, if not decreased. And a lot of people ignore that academia has not been able to gather a consensus about its definition or articulate its uses. Economists would never admit their irrelevance to human progress and to the pursuit of socioeconomic equality. Democracy is an archaic way to shop for ideas. When a society comes across a financial institution encounter, why do its political and social state worsen? It is seratum of females attributable to the limitations of the current mathematically contrived model and needs of a wider lens, a more integrative approach. Nations ought to explore the unspoken social conflicts within their society, excavate their evils, reintegrate sympathy and reason, and look at the whole arc. Gauging anything without the admission of subjectivity is to conceal the measurement's malleability. A lack of depth and diversity are the scapegoats when uniformity is the order of the day. We ought to implement technological advancement and the market of ideas. How about we individually introduce a list of concerns which get bundled up as the public aspirations and statically match them to candidates' pledges? This is an ideacy. Art answers, science solves. Art or science's disregard for concrete realities poses an enormous danger to humanity and thoroughly deserves capital punishment or death. Economics is a lethal weapon abused by lumpen intellectuals and political pundits to secure moneyers every time they are caught with their trousers down. There is much pressure on sages to sell capitalistic optimism. Economists as a branch of knowledge is doing humanity more harm than good. I am for the dismantlement of this outdated instrument in science. The onus to establish the conditions necessary for realizing this end cannot be passed onto academia. It would be like asking a lewd abbot to exorcise Lucifer. Their most famous recommendations are at the least perverse and preposterous. Ignaz Semelouis' mistakes was in trying to convince the culprits and medical providers instead of alerting victims and potential victims. He could not see himself confessing to or denouncing his brothers. So Junora took her battle to the most hostile audiences. The dismantling of economics is worth more than a passing thought, since it is doing humanity more harm than good. We ought to replace it with a quantum refinement of economics. This task requires attention, since the form of human linear collaborations and manipulations and the beehive of misery are not straightforwardly justifiable by the outmoded models. This task requires attention, since the form of human linear collaborations and manipulations and the beehive of misery are not straightforwardly justifiable by the outmoded models.